beanstalk. Yeah. Yes? Yes? This is the giant's wife speaks. Honestly, I was never in it for the eggs. Gold only glitters when there's something to beam at it. Otherwise, it's all just yellow weight. When my husband told me about the goose, I was still a pink and sticky child, more afraid of pickling in my father's house than the rantings of a madman who had a castle for me in the clouds. Golden eggs were the first to lose their charm. Gone like a girlish figure these ten years past. You know, I had taken to burying what we couldn't eat in the yard. Mad, I guess you'd call me. But turrets and a throne room are still four walls and a roof. When this is your home, it is your dusty, everyday home. My king rises each morning to fetch my bath and warm my milk. Every evening, I unbuckle his boots. For 15 years now, we have rounded each other's solitude, a rich and contented curse. And then that boy showed up, his thick vine pushing up through the clouds like fetish, putting me and my home on display. My gray hair, my too tight fading purple dress. It wasn't enough that I fed the boy. He had to take the goose, that ridiculous bird, and my husband, my good and frightful king, was already wading knee deep through the clouds. By the time I yelled for him, he was chasing the boy down the stalk, and I meant to say this. I meant to say supper in bed, and the thick crush of your wife's thighs are more than this half-sized boy could ever pluck from our story. But instead, I howled a low and shapeless moan to the back of his dear and fleeting head. I haven't left the doorway since. Bitten my nails down to the quick, spinning each half moon into these quietly darkening clouds. Wow. This next piece is the one that's actually in Gape Seed, which is an awesome collection. I encourage you all to check it out tonight. Uh, this is a sestina. How many of you are familiar with what a sestina is in poetry? No! For those who aren't familiar, a sestina is an exercise in not using a thesaurus. You get six words that you're going to repeat in six lines throughout six stanzas, and then the seventh stanza, you're going to use all of those words. So it's not that I just don't know some other words. I don't have a very small vocabulary, but that is in fact the form. I encourage you to check it out if you're a writer and are looking to experiment uh, with a form. It's a pretty cool one to play with. This is Sestina for April. When I heard about the goldfish, it was still summer. You can't plan these things. The information comes when it comes. So I had enough time to promise myself a trip to the Charles River that winter. Just me and an ice pick, maybe some fish food, to wait. See, the goldfish were descendants of better-kept ornamental ancestors that would wait patiently in bowls to be admired in a parlor or gazed at at a summer garden pond. Knickknacks of the animal kingdom, just charming enough to be kept for a grandchild that comes to visit. A lady to feel that she has something to care for but can break her promise if it becomes too tiresome to keep. I am told that's how they got into the river. I imagine whole swaths of 18th century maids would wait until a cover of darkness and then sneak down to the Charles River with a promise to their mistress that they would not be seen disposing of last summer's fashion admiring them, flopping like coins in the moonlight as the Charles' tide 
comes up to receive them. And they're still called just goldfish. Though I think that's like calling a cougar just a cat. See, the Charles River freezes over. I have been told it is too polluted for swimming. Its waters come down past banks of old industrial towns and wait patiently in the mouth of Boston Harbor to take with it what the summer boats and tankers, the garbage piles and the dirty, the dirty snow all promise to whisk away. So I went down to that river as promised because I was actually looking for evidence. Just a pulse, a slow and steady pulse to make it through to the summer. Something that I could take back to you and say, look, look at this foolish miracle that we made. I wanted a golden bobble with a two-year lifespan and a 200-year memory to wait patiently on a chain around your neck so that when the darkness, too thick to breathe, comes, when all that filthy backwater comes, when every ragged edge of a broken promise comes to collect on your frozen bones, you can lie and wait so still. No one will believe you're still there beneath the ice. Slow your pulse, just so. Match it to the tiny fish at your heart. I will take you both back to the water next summer. And I will. Summer comes. I promise. Just wait. Thank you. any of these poems, so hopefully it works out. And I won't explain them because we have no time. So this first one actually appears in Gapesy and it's called Freshen and Writer's Block. D. My spine is compressed until it becomes a frayed broomstick, sweeping past participles into the cow print carry-on I got on sale. Sitting atop, gripping the zipper, sweating and dripping onto full brown and white on white and brown, pushing down until she closes her mouth. Read. I live in a building. Inside that courting is an island. Wrinkled noses on wrinkled faces fill my neighbor's boxes. I forget my keys. I can't leave. I keep forgetting my keys. I remember that I forget my keys. The apartment is my orbit, Galileo. Brown and white on white and brown. Oh. I don't even know you and I hate you. Read. I never take the elevator. There's too much space for conversation. The stairs, the rape of silence, take flight. The middle steps on the third floor are bent in the middle. Does marble bend? This isn't real marble, Lucretia. Stop writing down what I say. I don't want to be your muse. X. There is a bottle. There is a message in the bottle. Gnaw the cork. I know who it's from. It's blank. Shatter the bottle, a million teeth. There's blood on my hands. Thanks, but they were never really my hands to begin with. Keep pushing that damn plastic crucifix into the meat of your palms. Make Christ out of your own image. Out my window, I see a war in my backyard. I am a sniper, a paparazzo heretic. I shoot stars I can't see off roofs I shouldn't be on. All to teach God a lesson. The alarms. Him. From this high, I watch sightless parents lead children to follow, and I swing from overgrown, overgrown antennas that long to lay their necks down into binary code. Sue. Their rust bites into fingers that would rather QWERTY than rick. That's pressure and writer's block. <laughs> this next one's pretty short, and it's, it thinks it's a sonic, but I don't think it actually is one. So he must have that. It's called He Lives in Musical Theory. I used to love a boy who played the piano with the same small hands that shared an apple with Eve. The sounds he made with his hands, the crash and cascade of keys, treble clefts and serpentine, half note shed scales down the spines of Eve and me and we. I say I used to because now I don't. 
Not because I don't want to or because I can't, but because he stopped. The boy no longer mimics God. He'd rather slither walk across Eden with honey hinged in his hips. All to kiss me on the forehead whenever my muscles invert a smile. His songs no longer pull apples down. No longer does he massage the small drums that orbit my eyes. And there's a music in there. This next one is, uh, I guess, dedicated to anyone who hasn't actually made out with a poet. So it's titled, To Kiss Another Poet. And I guess I should dedicate this to you, right? For your birthday? So, here we go. To kiss another poet is wit, is wit poured thick in glasses, an ember-rich amber swish that wicks sweet flames past lips perforating the tongue. To kiss another poet is false imprisonment, swallow keys and past lives, bunny-eared in time and tied to railroad ties. To kiss another poet is an accident, windshield wipers and shattered glass, asphalt whiplashed into wounds, braces foamed around necks and bruises breaking into ribs. To kiss another poet is words blurred, syntax stripped down to the musculature, revision wrestled and raised to the ground. To kiss another poet is bloody, Mary with a two by four staring back at you, licking her lips, lubricating night before entering dawn. To kiss another poet is the dance of Burt's Bees, whiskey and cocaine, the crescendo of pulses fighting against a trampoline, the tension at the lip of a glass of red wine. In tonight's bed, a poet lies, bent in half notes that belong to no one, but at the pose midnight strikes, arms above him, shirtless breaths make him lie. Thanks for having me.